Hello there, and welcome back to Valda Story. Today, we're going to beat the game. Before we do that though, let's learn the ultimate technique from Moira here. The Life Blade Technique. It is the final focus finisher that we can acquire. I think I might have said that of the party based one, but uh... That was a goof on my part, I'm sorry. So this one takes three quarters of your total HP, current HP rather, and its damage is based off of your maximum HP. It's honestly not that great. The damage isn't one to one with your HP, thank god, but it's still not all that much higher. I've never seen it do more than a few thousand, and when we're doing 1000 plus per hit, and we're doing like a billion hits per second, a few thousand really just is not all that impressive. I suppose you could probably make a build around it, stacking HP even more so than we've done, but I really don't see the point. It's more there for thematic purpose than anything. So, pretty much the first enemy we come across here in the sanctuary is another Rock Child. It goes so much more smoothly than the first encounter, which already went pretty smoothly. It's just no match for us at this point. I think the only reason it's really here is to act as the final line of defense for the soul of Valdus, instantly respawning a number of ferals to keep the demons and angels at bay. So again, more of a story thing than a gameplay thing. That's actually true of this area in general, I suppose. Except for the final boss, right here. As you can tell by the sigil surrounding her, she too has the same shield mechanic as the two super bosses. Rather than fighting for Elagath or Mogato, she fights for Valdus and wields the divine element primarily, although she does use all elements in her fight. Similar to the jellyfish fellow we fought earlier in that regard. And unlike the two super bosses, even if you have a pretty OP build, you can't really take her down quickly. Because even if you pile on the damage at certain segments of her health bar, she'll just go invincible and force you to fight through a few waves of fellows before you can start harming her again. And I certainly don't mind that. I'm not really good at holding back when I've made myself OP, so this actually does let me show off the Anemone fight to its fullest extent. Unlike what I did with the two super bosses. So yeah, after you do enough damage, she summons a whole bunch of fellows to assist her. You have to take them down, as well as any of the healing crystals that are active, similar to the Magus fight that, for her to become available to damage again. And each time you do this, she summons a successively stronger wave of fellows. It's actually a pretty fun boss fight, even if it isn't all that difficult. Simply because it ends up being a enemy rush of sorts against all the fellows you fought in the game. With a few exceptions. Some enemy types are just too lazy to show up and help here, I guess. I do think it's a shame that pretty much only regular fellows end up showing up to support her. It would be cool if some of the boss ones did as well, just, you know, with less HP so they're more manageable. That would end up making the fight more hectic in a good way, I think, and overall more difficult, rather than the kind of snooze fest it is. Still, it's a pretty damn good fight overall, especially since it tests your proficiency in pretty much all forms of gameplay engagement. Combat against a single tough opponent, a boss, combat against many lesser opponents, regular enemies, and the platforming since you have to platform around the room to reach those enemies. Hell, it even has a bit of environmental interaction going on since if you don't come here with a warmth elixir, you can power that mana heater that's at the top in order to prevent yourself from taking cold environmental damage. It's basically a pop quiz of everything you've learned in the game up till now making you exercise all of your knowledge, and preventing you from skipping your way through it if you have an overpowered character, since an enemy will automatically shield up once she reaches certain health thresholds, so you can't just one-cycle her like you could the other super bosses. 
So, having taken down Anemone, we come across our ultimate goal, Valdis. Not just her soul, but her still living physical form. I have to say, I really like the design of Valdis. First of all, the fact that she speaks in slightly different text boxes to get across the fact that she's a real deal god. And also just her character design in general, it really sells the fact that she is both a goddess of death and a goddess who is on the verge of death. Cracked her sternum, skull face, tattered clothes, etc. It's good stuff. Anyway, speaking to Valdus here, we learn a number of shocking plot revelations. Raina was originally from here, from Sithail, sent away in the care of the angel Abaddon to keep her safe. Safe from her goddess sisters, for she is Valdus's third child. Granted not power, but potential, in order to reclaim the world from the tyrannical rule of her sisters. So, uh, basically a very anime plotline, and one that's not really that surprising at all. I guess this does end up giving a story justification as for why Reyna starts out so weak, and yet grows so powerful. And why she's so associated with the divine element in particular, which is most strongly associated with the Ferals and Valdus herself. But I feel like that's probably reaching somewhat since plenty of angelic enemies end up making use of the divine element, Magus being a good example of that. And Gilda also starts out incredibly weak but gets stupidly overpowered by the end, so... One cool little lore detail that you'll actually end up missing if you don't read the enemy descriptions in the lore guide is that the fellow creatures here guarding Valdus were ancient prehistoric beasts that were resurrected by her after she was attacked by her daughters. So we basically been fighting dinosaurs the entire time. Oh, and yeah, I didn't comment on it at the time, but I really like Anemone's design as well. It's a weird combination of ancient marine life form and creepy jester lady, and it is just a pretty cool design overall. Unfortunately here, our conversation with Valdus is going to have to come to an end. She's basically only a step away from death, keeping herself alive simply to impart this information to us. And uh, the city is going to start collapsing when she dies as well. Turns out she's a load-bearing Valdus, which means it's time for that good old Metroidvania staple. Time to escape sequence at the end. I do think they dropped the ball a little bit here by not having you run through areas that you've previously been through, maybe backtracking to the start. Basically a direct Metroid reference at that point, but I think that would have been a lot more fun than what they do here, which is just having you go through a new sequence of platforming. It's still fine for what it is though, and acts as a platforming final boss, more so than the Anemone fight even was. So, we basically have two final bosses here, one for the fighting portion and one for the exploration portion, and that's actually pretty cool. You do want to try and go through this segment fairly quickly, it's not super tightly timed. And if you're decent at the platforming at this point, you shouldn't have any trouble making it, but it is possible to fail here. I've done that before, thanks to these spike boxes bouncing me about. Fortunately, we have made it here. Having the double jump certainly makes it a lot easier than it otherwise would be. And uh, you may be asking, why are we changing our spell loadout here at the end? Isn't this just the final cutscene to finish off the game? Well, you'll see. It used to be the case that that was the case. You have the fight with Anemone, the escape sequence, and then a cutscene before the credits to finish things off. Gilda here has to stabilize the mana crystal while Reyna charges it. But I guess the devs felt that Wyatt and Vladen weren't pulling their weight here and needed something else to do during this final sequence. Because they added a little something here. Yep, it's a rematch with Anemone, this time in her true form. This upcoming fight here was actually added in one of the earliest patches, I believe. 
And uh, I kind of wish they had him because it's not all that great of a fight. If you have a strong build, it's a breeze, and if you have a weaker build, it's kind of a slog. In terms of how the fight works, it's pretty similar to the first fight with her, but in reverse. She starts off with a full protective shield that you need to break by bashing at her head. To get up to there with most characters, Gilda says hi here, you have to break down those tentacles to have them act as platforms. Then once you've done that, you can actually attack her head and do damage to her health bar. Unfortunately, without the tentacle platforms, this can be pretty difficult for most characters. Gilda says hi here, by the way. And so, they give you these reckoning orbs to bat at her head to do damage for you. The reason why this fight can end up being a slog for some characters is that these orbs really don't do all that much damage unless you're a reckoning-focused Reina build, which we kind of are. That's part of the reason why I decided to focus on the magic tree and intelligence somewhat. But if you're Wyatt or Vladin, you're kind of screwed. Gilda ignores this bullshit entirely because she can end up having three consecutive jumps, so she has no trouble reaching an enemy's head. You can, of course, use the lightning air grapple to pull yourself up there directly and attack it yourself, but that's not always the most reliable since you can only score off a few hits and you have no means of manually targeting the grapple, so oftentimes it'll go for one of the enemies or the reckoning orbs. If your build is pretty overpowered, it doesn't matter because you'll do plenty of damage with those few hits, but if you have a weaker build, it ends up being a pretty huge slog, as I mentioned earlier. Funnily enough, Wyatt actually used to have the easiest time of all because his bleed did damage through her shield and it was quite potent. But I guess the developers considered that something of a glitch because they nerfed it. But that's neither here nor there as we are currently Reyna and are about to finish off True Anemone without too much trouble. If not for the fact that she is outright cheating here and not dying even though she's down to a single pixel. You know though, this would be a perfect moment to show off the life play technique since it will almost assuredly kill her since she has no HP remaining. And we have a use of it right here, which is why I don't do that. Yeah, I had intended to use the life blade to finish True Anemone off, but I kind of forgot. At least we get to see a bit of glitchiness here, I think due to how quickly I ended up killing Anemone. Normally the monsters are supposed to disappear instantly, but there they continued attacking us. I wonder if it would be possible to die during that brief segment and glitch out the game in some fashion. Eh, that's for someone somewhere else to test. But yes, that was the truly for reals final battle, so now we have nothing left but to enjoy some pretty good artwork, some cutscenes, and the credits. I uh, see someone here was inspired by Helsing Ultimate. Losing a left arm and growing a shadowy replacement that makes you way stronger? Yeah, don't think I didn't catch that. Helsing Ultimate is pretty good if you like ultra-violent anime starring vampires. Pretty badass vampires too. I wasn't speaking there for a bit just so you could enjoy this rendition of the main theme of the game. I'm not sure what instrument that is, I think it might be like a... a lute? Some sort of string instrument? I don't know. But it sounds really nice. Anyway, we end up ending with this pretty cool pose shot as we escape the city and everyone else presumably drowns to death. We, uh, probably should have done something about that, shouldn't we have? Oh well. But that's Valda's Story, Abyssal City, developed by Endless Fluff Games. I hope I've done a good job of showing off exactly why I like this game as much as I do. 
It's a fun mix of both exploration and combat, the latter of which you rarely see all that much attention paid to in the Metroidvania genre. Most tend to focus purely on the former. And it has a surprising amount of depth with the RPG character building stuff which lends it a lot of replayability despite the short playtime. Oh, and for taking down the eyes of Algath and Morgado, we get some bonus scenes here in the credits. I would say that they're sequel hooks, but I'm honestly not sure if they were intended as that, given the fact that developers don't seem too intent on continuing this IP. At the very least, their next game is in a wholly new IP, so if we do end up getting a sequel to this in whatever form it may take, it's not going to be for a while. At least we get some more character designs, seeing a full face shot of Mogato, as well as Wyatt's mother and sister. I think I mentioned this before, but I do appreciate how most of the important characters in the game are women. That's a rare sight to see in games. Anyway, we come to the Kickstarter backer portion of the credits. None of these names are especially worth mentioning, except for one near the bottom. A certain Edwin Tiang, contributor of the Ben McSteely character. One of the crew members that we rescued and one who gives us a focus finisher, where we befuddle enemies by throwing a banana. You may recognize Edwin Tiang's name if you viewed Retsupre's content circa 2007 as he voiced the main character of the Trapped series of Flash games that they made fun of. And I only just realized going through the credits this time that his character contribution is probably a reference to that role, because the character's name was Dan McNeely, which is awfully similar to Ben McSteely, and probably the most memorable thing from that series was a bullshit adventure game style puzzle, where you had to make a fishing rod using a banana. But yeah, it was just funny seeing and recognizing that name in the credits for the first time since uh, playing through for this LP was the first time I actually bothered to watch the credits. I've always skipped them because I never bothered to watch them in any game I play. Anyway, that's it for the credits, but we're not done quite just yet. We still have one more post-credits bonus scene to view. I gotta say, Raina's looking pretty badass. I quite dig the Seda look that she seems to have going on here. And much like her mother, she's using the old family trick of mass necromancy. This does make me wonder if they ever do end up making a sequel to this game, if it will end up being in a different genre entirely. Some sort of squad or party based game, as opposed to a single character controlled one. Basically what I'm saying is I want anime XCOM. And hey, the developers might end up making that since their current project is a tactical RPG, one based in a wholly new IP as I mentioned before. So with this cutscene about to end, we have only one more thing to view before finishing the game, although I will note that the LP is far from over at this point. We still have to go through the game as Vladin, and his campaign is a fair bit different than most of the other characters, so it's worth watching- God fucking damn it. Look at that item score, 98%. I always end up missing one or two items. One of these days I'll have my perfect S rank and get those Chivos, but today is not that day. But yeah, stay tuned for next time when we start Vladin's campaign and start seriously getting into magic in this game.